Hello and welcome to Life Beyond the Numbers, the podcast for people who are curious about how to have a more fulfilling work life. We live in a world largely driven by numbers, logic and reason. But how we feel at work and about our work impacts us, our organisations and society. There is a relationship between the numbers of our organisations and the life beyond the numbers. I'm Susan Michrielon, your host. I've lived and worked in many countries. I've met people who love what they do and people who don't. People who bring their full selves to work and people who won't. But one thing that I've learned that is common to us all is that we are all unique and have unique experiences. And it's helpful to know that there are others who think like we do, or have had struggles too, or have gone where we want to go, or can show us things we didn't know. So join me and my guests as we place a lens on the human side of work life by sharing insights, stories and strategies to inspire you to let your uniqueness shine. Today, I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Diego Adame on Life Beyond the Numbers. Diego, welcome. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. And if the next minutes are as good as the previous five, ten minutes, it's going to be a great chat. Oh, listen to that. Diego, the charmer ever. (laughs) Diego and I worked together many years ago and we've just been reminiscing. And we stopped because we would probably have just kept talking and then the whole episode would have been not recorded. So Diego, I like to look at numbers from an unusual perspective. It doesn't just have to be about the bottom line and profit and loss, but The number 40 is the one that definitely jumps out when I think about you, especially in this last year. So tell me about turning 40. Yeah, I mean, I think we definitely shared that bit of nerdy obsession with numbers. And I also have the same that I'm always looking at the numbers. I I heard one of your episodes about turning 49 and how that's seven times seven and the 13 cycles of 40 of 40 days and i love it and my brain works like that and i always i'm thinking what do the numbers mean and i i started 10 years ago using my birthday as an excuse to think of the number and plan something around that number so every year for my birthday i do something that is related to the number of years that i am turning and because this year is my 40th i wanted to go all out and see like what could be an epic way to celebrate my 40 slash not think about the fact that I'm turning 40 or that I'm 40 already I keep forgetting that I'm 40 (laughs) so all year I've been celebrating my 40th birthday with 40 challenges with 40 friends and family members cool and what you've been doing Diego is tracking this or recording it as well and that's what we're going to spend a bit of time talking about But there's a few things that really stood out. And I was thinking about this this morning, actually. And I think what you've just said there is the thing that stands out most on reflection for me is that you didn't do this alone. So you've taken on these 40 challenges over the last year, but none of them were alone, I think. Maybe apart from the push-ups, which you haven't finished yet. (laughs) And it's not alone. And it was an important component that it was about doing it with someone else, with friends. And I actually asked 40 people for them to challenge me. So I had my rules and I was like, I wanted to challenge me. And the rules were, it has to be a challenge for you. It has to be a challenge for me. And we both have to do it either physically together or virtually together, but it's something that we are doing. And I have to say, when I thought about it, I didn't realize how incredible, I mean, the main takeaway for me for the whole year has been spending quality time with all these people, because as we get older, it's more, and also we have a similar career. That means that many of our family members and friends are in different parts around the world. And to spend time with people is very difficult. And it has been incredible to be able to spend a day, a weekend, a week, every single day, 
connecting with people and having like true quality time. And yeah, so it, it was an important part for, for me, for the challenge that I had to be shared with someone that I care, that I love, that is close to me. And just to say, when you were starting saying about the recording, I also thought, because I know that's another thing that we share, one of my favorite things about my challenges is the fact that I have a spreadsheet where <laughs> I can track all the challenges. I have a percentage completion on an average Every single day I go through the spreadsheet and I like, oh, I, I know that right now I am at 99.7% of completion of my challenges. But yeah, it's something that only someone like you would understand. And I'm sure other people that are also love a good spreadsheet will understand, but it has been a source of great satisfaction through the year. Even I was a bit blown away by your spreadsheet and your tracking, I must say. <laughs> it was taken to an extreme. <laughs> Let's go back a little bit, because actually the first time I met you, you were just returning from Kilimanjaro. And that was what you did for your 30th birthday, right? And I had to laugh because you write somewhere that you were starting to feel old. So now 10 years later, how do you feel about aging? I think I feel a lot better. I never thought about that. But yeah, when we did Kilimanjaro with my best friend, it was this sense of we're getting old. I mean, we're turning 30, which now sounds ridiculous that <laughs> thought that 30 was old. <laughs> and it was this sense of like, what have we done in life? We need a big achievement. And we started thinking, and that's how we came up with, let's go and climb Kilimanjaro, the tallest mountain in Africa. And because it was a big deal turning 30, I think 40, I take it more with humor. And even as you know, my blog is called, this is not a midlife crisis. But I think I, I have learned to appreciate aging. And as my husband, Tim says, aging with grace and just embracing it. And now we're older and that's okay. And that you can tell from our body or our strength or our mind or whatever. But it's also a part of enjoying life. And I think if you are in a good place in life, age for me is just an excuse to celebrate and spend time with people that I love. Yeah, age is just a number. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's a linear way of kind of moving through life, isn't it? Of keeping track. But I often think I don't feel any different in one way than when I was in my 20s. Yeah. Or sometimes I can be even transported back further, especially with laughter or humor and, and just feel like a child. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel exactly the same way. But it's then, it's looking the other way, perhaps, at what's coming ahead. <laughs> That's what I was thinking about. Like, 40s are fantastic. Absolutely. They've been a brilliant decade, and definitely. But getting to 49 freaked me out because 50 is looming. And that sounds old now, but it's not. But I feel like it's the same every decade. Do you think, like, oh, the next decade, that's, that's old. I, I remember it, like, when you're 15, you really think that 30 is old. And when you're 30, I remember even feeling bad for my friends who were turning 40. And I was like, that's properly old. And now I am like, yeah, no, 50 is old. <laughs> Sorry, no, Susan, <laughs> you're getting into old. <laughs> <years>. <laughs> oh my gosh. You decided you were going to do 40 challenges throughout the year, like you said. And you en enlisted your friends and family to challenge you. So, Let's talk about some of these things that you've done and how you managed to do them, because obviously you were working pretty much full time as well. Yeah, most of the time I was working full time, except for these last two months. But yeah, I was working full time. I did. I was a strategic. And last year I saved a lot of annual leave because I knew that this year was going to be a busy year. But yeah, I have been really busy this year. Like I, I didn't have any time to watch TV or Netflix or be on social media as much because... I was really busy. Every single day I had a challenge going on or I had two or three that I had to do every single day. And it also makes you reflect like, what was I doing before with all that time that I'm using to do so many things? Yeah, that's something that I keep thinking about. And I don't know. And probably the answer is that I was just in social media or doing something not very meaningful. Going for dinner. Probably. <laughs> you were always going for dinner from what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> So what were some of the challenges? The ones that come to mind 
and I'm sure I, I always forget some of the big ones, but the, I mean, the skydiving is probably like a, what someone would expect of a challenge turning 40. I've never done it. And that's a big one. And probably if for my 39, I've gone skydiving, that will be the highlight of my year. And that's what it's crazy about all these challenges that skydiving was just one of the things that I did this year. There were a lot of physical ones, learning new sports or trying new sports like surfing and snow kiting and paddle boarding and yoga, which I've never done before. And I found that yeah, hard to believe else. that you'd never done yoga before. No, never. I never liked it. And you started with yoga with Adrienne. Yeah, we, I think she does a 30 day challenge. And that, that was with, with Tim. So he organized it in a way that he had like some intro ones. Then we did the 30 day challenge. And then we did five more, like a, a sort of graduation. And he made one routine to make it a bit more special. And that was how we started the year. We started the year doing yoga every single day for 40 days and being sober, which team regrets every single day that he suggested that, but it was okay. And I like what you said about your spoiler alert about yoga and sobriety. Uh, yeah. Whenever I said we're going to be sober for 40 days and we're going to be doing yoga every single day, I think immediately people assume that this is going to be great for you and you're going to be full of energy and you are going to have better skin. I don't know why people kept saying about the skin. I never noticed if my skin changed or not, but nothing really changed. It was really nice to know the, that we could do it. And uh, I think by doing yoga, if I had done yoga probably a couple of times, I would never do it again. But we created a bit of a habit. And I know you also talked a, a, a bit about that, about creating those habits. So now it's something, not that I do regularly, but I do once in a while. I'll do some yoga. I appreciate it and I, I enjoy it. And that was nice. And and in some ways, the same with, with drinking, being honest. I mean, as we know, the pandemic got many of us to drink a bit more, especially at the beginning. And we were drinking wine every single day with dinner or after work. And, and just by being sober for 40 days, I mean, and it's not in any way that we were alcoholics or anything like that. I mean, but, but we were used to drinking quite often and it's, it's a good reminder that sometimes you really don't need it and you just do it because out of inertia or because it's there. And I think that's something that we have done that now we're more intentional of when are we having a glass of wine and when we don't need to have a glass of wine and that's okay. But you did try 40 new wine grapes. Yes. Many of my challenges are very contradictory because one of the <laughs> challenge was trying 40 new wine grapes, which was a really fun challenge. And challenge here is very loosely used, right? Because it's not uh, that much of a challenge to try 40 different wine grapes. It was the same as we had one challenge with a friend that we couldn't have any processed sugar all of September. But then I had another challenge, which was having 40 different desserts. So it was a bit going from one extreme to the other through the year. And ice cream. I liked that one. Oh, yeah. We also <laughs> had one of eating ice cream at every ice cream shop in Copenhagen, where we live. It was a proper challenge. I, I would say that one was a challenge because some days we'll have to eat five or six ice creams and also with the rules that we had it meant that we actually had to eat the full ice cream and having three four five per day is a lot and then when you do that three days in a row you are disgusted but then we had to do it because it was a challenge <laughs> and cheese that one really struck me yes that one has a bit of a backstory because for health reasons from 2006 till 2020, so that was 14 years, I didn't eat any dairy products. And I got used to it and it was okay. And I didn't eat any cheese or any milk or yogurt, I mean, dairy. And through what I like to call the COVID miracle, I don't know why. I, I was, so every year I tried to eat a bit of dairy and it was usually my stomach directly really poorly. But during COVID that we had more control over what we were eating, I started doing that and in inserting dairy a little, little by little until I was fully back. And so I have a friend who was always feeling very sad for me. Like if I will eat a pizza without cheese, which for me was perfectly normal. 
and he always fed some, some for me so he thought and i think it was a brilliant idea that we should have 40 different cheeses in 40 days which also it wasn't that easy i wouldn't say it was challenging but it wasn't easy to find 40 challenge 40 different cheeses and then and with like a bit more than a month it was great i haven't had cheese for such a long time and it's crazy that my 40 years i've never had a camembert or a blue cheese or some cheeses that are not that common in mexico where i'm from and all of a sudden i was trying cheese at 40. Brilliant. 40 cheese and 40 wine. 40 cheese and wine. Did you do them yeah. together? No? We did a couple that were yeah. together. So it was like a jackpot. That, okay, now I, because I had all my spreadsheets, right? So I had the wine one and the cheese one. <laughs> and you kept them as well. Yeah. For every oh. single challenge, I have a... a wow. <laughs> Are you going to write a book? Well, I feel like that blog is a bit of a book. I never thought in my life that I would write a book. But after writing 40 blog posts, I mean, that could be a book. <laughs> but also it made it more real that I, I thought that writing a book is something absolutely impossible that I would never be able to do. And I, again, I'm not comparing a blog with a book, but just knowing that I was able to write 40, well, actually it was 50 posts. I can see that it's doable. I also had a challenge, which was a creative writing challenge, which I also really enjoyed. And, and yeah, and I, and I, I also. That was an unusual my... one, Diego. Tell us a bit more about that one. Yeah. So the, the concept was, it was a group of five people and the five people, I mean, there were three friends of mine and then one of them brought another friend, but my friends didn't know each other. So it's people that didn't really know each other. And we all came together to write a story and the rules were, we each had one week to write a chapter of the book. So it was five of us. The story had 25 chapters. So each of us will write five chapters and you had one week to write your chapter. And when you got it, you could only read the last chapter. So I will write something, then four more people will write after me and I will only read what the last people wrote, which sometimes was completely <laughs> different story to what I had written. and. It's, it was like such a good exercise to let go because then maybe you have an idea for one of the, I, I remember I introduced a character that it, it was, that was into astrology because I'm the opposite. I don't believe in astrology. I think it's silly. And so I wanted to play with that. And I was like, I will have someone that is like really into astrology and the science and all that. And when I received the story back, my astrologist was on a, like a renowned astronomer working for NASA or something like that. And I was like, no, he was supposed to be someone who believed in astrology, not an astronomer. And probably one person along the way thought that I got confused and I didn't know. There's no way that they will write about astrology, so it must be an astronomer. And so that was the end of that person in my story. And in the end, when you read it back, was it a story? Surprisingly, it was a story. Yeah, we were all impressed. It actually had, had a flow and the person who ended the story ended really nicely because she realized that we confused some things and then there was like one person that some people thought was good, the other person, other people thought was bad and she had a brilliant idea at the end. They were twins and all along they were twins. And but yeah, if you read it, I don't, I'm not sure it's a good read. <laughs> Lots of people have asked if they can read it and they have downloaded it. No one has commented. No one has told me what they thought. So I can only assume that it's either really boring and you cannot get past a few pages or it's really bad and they feel bad to say anything about it. But it's definitely a fun exercise. And again, it really gets you going with writing because you just have to write. start writing and be <laughs> creative and... Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the things that uh, with writing that I keep reading about is basically to write. You just need to write. Yeah, and that was exactly the same with with this blog. I never in my life had a blog. And that, that was some, it's another of the challenges to have the... This is the only one that I'm doing on my own, the writing and keeping the blog updated. And I remember I used to like writing, but then I kind of forgot about it or got lazy and I don't write anymore. So it was a good way to get back into writing. And it's true what, exactly what you say. Like many times I'm like, what am I going to write about this challenge? And then it's just a matter of 
start writing whatever, even if maybe it's related or not. And it's amazing how your brain starts working and all of a sudden you have a post and then you go and read it again and you add more and then it's done. And I really surprised myself. Sometimes when I reread what I wrote, I was like, I have no idea that was in my plans or that I wrote that. Actually for this podcast, when I knew that you were going to read some of those posts, I went back and I started reading them. And many of them, I did not remember that I wrote those things. And it's, yeah, it's like such a good reminder of the, how powerful it is to, to write and just get going. Yeah. And like writing is thinking. I mean, that's what yeah. it is in a way, isn't it? It's a way to get your thoughts out. And like that, you said, you don't remember. You can look back on these blog posts forevermore and they will bring back memories as well. Yeah, and definitely. I oh, I have so many thoughts now because I think writing has played... It's funny that in a podcast about numbers, now we're talking so much but about But we're writing. not talking about numbers ever. It's always the life <laughs> beyond those numbers, Diego. This is the important stuff. <laughs> Is there a life beyond numbers, Susan? <laughs> <laughs> there is. We're talking about it. <laughs> but I was thinking, like, writing, it has had such a different role throughout my life. This year, writing was a lot of reflection. It was a lot, I think, humor, or at least that something that I think is humorous. Maybe no one will agree with me, but I enjoyed that, like, joking in my writing a little bit. And... But a, a big part of my life, writing was a coping mechanism and, and a way to express feelings and not having someone to talk about. It was just me writing. And that's the way that I, I was able to, to deal with adversity. I mean, this is specific, like when I, when I was growing up, I mean, being a, a gay man, a closeted gay man in Mexico, and you live in this universe where you think that you are the most horrible thing and it's wrong and at the time there were no role models there was no one around me who would show me that it's okay to be gay and it's absolutely no problem so everything I heard was the opposite right and I couldn't talk with anyone because what if they discovered that I'm gay so the only escape that I had was to write to write those thoughts and get on with it I was also thinking about it because one of the challenges this year that I love, one of my friends gave me that, that she created a book and she had 40 questions and I had to answer each question with a picture and really good questions about reflecting about life, about, about my past, about my present, about where I want to go. And that helped me because that meant that I had to go back to many memories, some of them tough memories a box that probably I didn't want to open, but I think it was really good that I did open it. And by looking at that, there were some of the questions that I, I just couldn't find the answer. There was one question about what's the worst decision of your life, or there was another question, what's the best advice that anyone has given you? And I had some ideas of how to answer those questions, but then for some reason, I remember those things that I wrote when I was a teenager because I had them in my computer. <laughs> Fun fact, they are password protected because I didn't want anyone to read them, but the password was gay. <laughs> <laughs> well, no one would have thought of it by what you're exactly. saying anyway. So. <laughs> I think that was my rationale. No one knows I'm gay. I don't want them to know, so they would yeah. never think that my password no. is gay. <laughs> and so I went back to all those things that I wrote and... Wow. It was it was tough. It was really tough to open those memories, but it was it was also so good to remind myself of. Uh, I think it's important to respect and appreciate our past, even if they were not the best moments, because then you are gonna appreciate more what you have right now. And like just thinking, reading through those texts and thinking where I am today, and I'm like, that's incredible. I mean, there is no way that that. 15, 16 year old kid will ever imagine that will have the life that I have now. And, and yeah, and it was incredible. And literally one of my posts was called the worst decision of my life. And I had no idea. I didn't remember that. And when I started reading, I was like, yeah, of course I remember that. And so that's another reason why I'm so happy that I've been documenting all of this this year, because I am sure that when I'm 50 or 60 or 70, I will go back to 
2022 and read what I wrote. And maybe it will be different. Maybe that will be energy to be like, oh, actually life could be really good because I'm feeling great this year. And it will be a uplift to read this and to remind myself that life could be as good as it is for me right now. Who knows, maybe life will be better and we'll be like, how little did I know that life could be this good? I don't know, but it's, it's so good to take that time to look back and see where we were and where we are and where we're going. I don't know. Yeah, and I mean, that's, I'm fascinated, first of all, that you had a computer when you were 15. <laughs> so that's brilliant. I used to keep diaries. And, and they're still at home in a wardrobe, these diaries from when I was a 13 to 18 year old or whatever. And actually, maybe I should pull them out and go through them. And they're stuffed with letters and everything I collected along the way as well. Reflection. So if you reflect now on this year and we talked about skydiving and you talked about that challenge and writing, but what else stands out? What was the biggest surprise perhaps of the year? I think that, yeah, I know exactly which one it is, which is a great story. And also can, it's a fun story, but also has a lot of meaning, which was when two friends challenged us to dress up as ants <laughs> and go around Mexico city and be tourists in Mexico city where they still live in Mexico City. I am from Mexico City. When they told me the challenge, I I wasn't sure. I was like, okay. And even they were a bit unsure when I published all of my challenges. They texted me and they were like, we need to change the challenge. This is like so lame. You have really cool challenges. Ours is the worst. And we're like, no, let's try it. Let's see where it goes. And little did we know that it was going to be the best challenge of the year. And one of the happiest days of my life, they actually had custom made this and costumes. And we just went out in Mexico City. Everyone will assume that we were drunk. We were not. Most of the time, we were not even drinking. And it was great to just go to different neighborhoods of Mexico City. So we went to the very posh area of the city where people just staring at us and not engaging probably just judging us but then we went to the more popular sides of the city it's a place called Chapultepec which is like a massive park forest in the middle of the city and there's a lake and we got on this little boat with our hands dresses and the great thing about doing something like this in Mexico City is that people celebrated people were so excited except for the posh parts of the city but it's not only that they are okay with it or that they don't care they will celebrate and they will be so excited they will cheer they were asked questions. So many people wanted to take pictures with us. And you just feel like a rock star when you are with a silly ant costume at your 40 years. It was also 35, 36 degrees in Mexico City. And we had these black leggings and this plastic <laughs> costume that it was so warm, but it was just incredible. And it was just a beautiful day and beautiful in the way that it was a great day. And I can remember being so happy for such a long amount of time as I was that day. We just loved it. And the other reflection I was thinking, and it goes back to the reflection and memories, which is one of my big learnings of the year. When I was talking with my sister when I was going to dress up as an aunt, and she was like, but that's not a challenge because you always love to dress up and I was like absolutely not I hate to dress up and and that's something that I as an adult I really hate dress up I hate Halloween parties I just don't like the idea of dressing up and she said that's not true when you were a child you were always dressing up and I was like well, what are you talking about in my mind I had created the narrative that my childhood was a really sad childhood and I have come to terms with that. And I usually don't want to think about my childhood because there are bad memories for the same reasons of not feeling accepted or that I belong somewhere. And so that's the narrative that I have. And even in the when I was doing my reflection for my pictures and all of that, it was always I had the idea, oh, I don't want to think about my childhood because it was a really sad time. And when I was looking for pictures for that exercise, I went through albums that my mom has at her place 
And I found a picture of my family all dressed up for a dinner or a lunch at our place. And I was dressed in a Spider-Man costume. <laughs> at the moment I saw that picture, all the memories came back to me that I absolutely love to dress up as a child. And I just, I had blood that from my, from my memories. And for me, that was like so powerful of like, sometimes for coping, we block bad moments to forget about them. But also sometimes we might block good moments because we constructed a narrative that I had a really sad childhood, but it wasn't true. Not that it was the happiest, but it, it was probably like any other childhood. It has its lows and its highs, but there were some great moments in my childhood. And I think for me, that's one of the biggest learnings of the year to remember that narrative that we create and that we have to go back and don't trust your brain so much. Sometimes there are things that are hiding from you or you are hiding for whatever reason. And it was very mind blowing for me to go through that. Uh, that, that is, yeah, it's like you've said, you've constructed a narrative and then everything had to stay in that narrative and everything else just got left behind because it didn't serve a purpose. Yeah. And your brain played the game with you because it wants to please you. Exactly. Wow, amazing. Now, you also talk about your siblings as being the biggest influences in your life, which I love. Tell us yeah. more about your siblings and that mm. challenge. I am the youngest of four. I would say we are close to each other. We were very close growing up. We were always playing and fighting because we're quite different. And we are, I think we all have kind of strong personalities. And so I have my older sister, she's a child psychologist. She works for the public health system in Mexico. The next one, she is a marine biologist. She lives in Australia. She's an academic. She's always around mangroves and she's doing really cool work, seeing how mangroves can reduce carbon emissions. The next one is my brother. He's only one year older than me. He is a computer engineer. He has worked in tech all of his life. He lives in San Francisco. That's a good tech person. And then me, I live in Denmark and I've been working in the social sector for a long time. So it's an eclectic mix of personalities that I really enjoy. It's great to grow up and be with people that are so different to you. It's also challenging at times because there's a lot of disagreements. And funnily enough, I always take the lead. What I understand that I take a role more of like a middle child. I am the one that is always managing conflict among us. So I'm also the one that is trying to make sure that everyone is happy. And that if there are communication problems, I will be like, hey, what they meant is this or what they meant is that. Maybe they don't agree with me. I think they would agree with me. <laughs> If you listen to this, let me know if you agree with me. And so asking them to do a challenge, I knew it was going to be a proper challenge to ask them because of everything I just said. And it was the first thing that my older sister said, like, I challenge you to not travel for 40 days. And I'm like, how is that celebratory? Do you understand what I'm trying to do here for, the, for this year? And I'm the eldest, you know, we're, we're a funny lot. Yeah, yeah. And then I challenge you to spend 40 days at my place with my kids. I'm like, I don't think anyone wants that. I don't even think your kids want that. <laughs> I love them, but I don't think anyone will be happy if I was 40 straight days <laughs> with them. And my brother was like, I challenge you to swim 40 kilometers in a month. And I'm like, I, I don't swim. I'm not a swimmer. I Last time I swam, I was probably 15 years old. And... So it was a typical disagreement with my siblings. And then I was like, well, it seems like they will not be challenged with my siblings and that's okay. And then my other sister said like, oh yeah, I'm doing the swimming challenge. And she started doing it without telling me. So at the end of the day, we did the swimming challenge. We swam 40 kilometers through the year, which was a proper challenge for me. And I'm really happy we did it. But, uh, but yeah, it will feel really incomplete if this year I didn't have something with my siblings because there are such a big part of my life I wouldn't forgive myself if there wasn't a challenge with them fantastic and yeah and it sounds like it was a good one I can't believe you weren't swimming since you were 15 
Yeah, I don't think so. Like, I mean, yeah. I've been in, I've been in the yeah. water for yeah. sure. But, yeah. But like properly swimming lanes. Wow. We talked a lot there about play and childhood and yeah. it ties really nicely into what you do in the world now, Diego, I think. So tell yes. us, what is your role? Yeah. At I, work, I should say, at work. <laughs> I work for the Lego Foundation, Lego as the toys. That <laughs> I think everybody know. knows what Lego is. <laughs> yeah, which is great. I mean, that's such a privilege to work for a brand that is so well known. Whenever I talk to anyone about my job, people get excited because I think most people have a positive association of our brand. And for the last seven years, almost eight years, I've been with Lego Foundation doing different things, but everything we do in Lego Foundation is around play. It's around making sure that kids play and they have access to play because we know that play is the best way for children to learn, to develop, to learn how to collaborate, to be creative, to learn how to cope, to be resilient. There are so many benefits of play, but somewhere along the way, the idea of play got downgraded to something meaningless or something that if kids, if they behave well, now they can play. Or if they do their math and reading, now they can play. And we're saying, why is that the case? If they play, they can thrive and they love it. I mean, who doesn't love to play? And what I've done through the years is more from the program management side, making sure how do we design programs or strategies to make sure that kids play more. And my area of focus has been early childhood. So the first six years of life, which are the most important years in the life of a person, because we know if children play, they are developing lots of skills. If they play with their parents, they are creating a bond with them. They are being social. They're hearing words. There are millions of benefits about play, but somehow, well, not somehow, I know, I know the reasons or I, I understand some of the reasons parents or adults sometimes don't spend time playing with the kids. There is a big issue. There is no time. We know that people have long working hours. People are tired. There's dynamics of cities, traffic, all of that, which means that there's less time to spend with kids. But if they were to spend time playing, that will make a big difference in the brain development of the child, which is, for me, I'm so passionate about it. And I don't understand why it's so difficult to convince people sometimes because there is science that the brain of a child never develops as much as it does in the first six years of life. And the best way for these connections to be strong and to develop is through quality interactions. They call it serve and return. They, they give and they take. So the baby is doing something and the adult or the other or the peer is doing something. And the best way of interaction and the easiest one to do is play. And if you are playing with a child, you are interacting with them. And that means that their brain is developing stronger connections. And even though the science is there, still people are like, play, that's kind of secondary. Is it just because it's free? <sighs> I never thought about that, but it might be. Actually, we don't have to spend money to play. We can just yep. go out in the garden and invent something or in the living room or whatever. And we've become very focused on the numbers, the finances and spending yep. money on stuff. And OK, yeah, we spend money on Lego. But when I had Lego as a child, it was really basic stuff. And you had to use your imagination to do anything with it. Yeah, we were talking about it just before the we started the recording, but even as adults, like play is so useful even in the workplace. I mean, when we were working together, we had all these playful activities or dynamics that we had, and they really helped us to sometimes to cope. Yes, because sometimes situations were not great and play was a great way to get away from all of it. But sometimes also to create a connection among us and to work better together. and. The thing with play, play always makes it more memorable, at the very least. And some of my fondest memories when we were working together were around play. And we were not calling it play, but it was play what we were doing. Yeah. And like it stands out for me. And, and I think what you say about the coping mechanism, for sure, because we had one game 
<laughs> it was really good fun where when somebody annoyed us or we got frustrated with somebody, you you came up with this one and I loved it. We would take their initials and come up with a positive statement to go yeah. with their initials and write it up on the whiteboard. So it looked like we were being very positive in our office. <laughs> Now, for what, anyone what, what, listening, they're probably going, what the hell are they talking about? But Yeah, I, th- I think we need an example. We do. So, so like JF, who was John Fairhurst, who was our boss. Hi, John. <laughs> hi, John, if you're listening. He would be like jolly friendly. Yeah. Or something like that. I mean, it was quite like, it wasn't, it was a bit obvious as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, but it was a great way for us to vent because most likely it was because we were annoyed with them but also to think about something positive of them. And I think it took away the, probably the frustration that we had with those. I mean, our board was full of two <laughs> sets of two words. There were many people who were frustrating us for sure, but it was, it was just like a great coping exercise. Yeah. And we worked very hard. I think we, we actually worked really hard in the, in the yeah. role we were, roles we were in. But we brought humor and a sense of fun. And like you say, that made bonds between us that allowed us, I suppose, to. It was a psychologically safe environment. I think we could bring up anything amongst each other. And that was really helpful because we made progress slowly. but We made progress. Yeah. And I think what has happened with me and my relationship with to play is that I didn't realize that I was passionate about play until I defined it. Because when I reflect back in my life, I've been a teacher. I I have taught math a a lot in in my previous life. And I was always using play without calling it play. And at at work, I love being playful and coming up with all these ideas. And probably sometimes it's to avoid awkwardness and just to create like a good environment. And sometimes it's just to make it fun and enjoyable, to make it memorable. But only when I started working at Lego Foundation and we talk so much about play and we have all the world experts about play and I was like, oh, what I'm doing is play and that's actually really good. But sometimes it happens that you don't realize that you like something until someone tells you like, oh, that's what you're doing. And is play different from creativity then or is creativity a form of play? Oh, that's an excellent question. We had a conference two years ago The that... I was quite involved and it was about talking about exactly what's the connection between creativity and play. And I'm not an expert in creativity or in play, I would say. I mean, I, I love play, but what the expert would say is like thermos synonym. When you are playing, you are developing creative skills. And so you cannot think of one without the other. Yeah. And I think that's so interesting what we talk about in school and the children not having time for play. I mean, school has a lot to do with it, that that creativity is is shut down a lot I think in the early years I don't know if it still is but for me I would say if I look back on this year 2022 well this will go out in 23 but looking back on 2022 it's been about finding creativity Mm. or refinding it or rediscovering it and it's fascinating how I think at work, one of the things we used to have on our annual performance reviews was creative thinking. (laughs) And it was always one of those ones was like, oh, God, what do you put here? But actually, (laughs) I don't think anyone knew what to put there. But just what we're talking about now opens up that creative thinking. Yeah, never thought about it. But yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, and it's underutilized or appreciated, I think, as a as a skill. So working at lego is that a playful environment as well it is and it's uh, it's funny because internally probably we say it's not enough but when i talk with other people about what a day is like for us they're like oh that's pretty playful and sometimes in the teams that i've been part of i always try to bring that playful aspect but we try as much as possible whenever we have team meetings or sites for the whole organization everything is play. So instead of doing a presentation, it's more like storytelling or it's coming up with a song or it's building something or we try as much as possible to walk the talk. And the same in the corporate side and the Lego side, because we 
we're separate, even though we are both part of the same family. The corporate side is also, it's quite playful. One of the big priorities for both organizations is that we bring more play into the workplace because clearly it makes a difference. And if that's what we are trying to promote, we need to live it. But if, if you go to any Lego office in the world, and if you go to a meeting room, there will be a ball of Lego bricks and it's perfectly fine that you are playing during a meeting. If the CEO is there and you are just like playing with some Lego bricks, absolutely no one will say anything. That's perfectly understandable, but that's probably more on the superficial side, but we try as much as possible to incorporate play into, into everything we do. And obviously every organization we work for is different, but looking back on the different organizations you have been a part of, does that stand out now? Can you see a difference in the environment? I do, I, definitely. I think, as you were saying, it creates more of a safe space, but also the great thing, and one of the, I think the last episode that you released, that was talking about the nature and what it means to be out in nature. And, and I think the... The, the person that you interviewed, she was saying about how being in nature removes hierarchies. And I thought about that, but that's exactly also what we say with play. Something that we do in, in the foundation is that every year we have a conference in Denmark and we invite world experts on education and early childhood, not only play, because we're trying to convince them about play. And we bring ministers, people from Minister for Education and people from foundations, World Bank, civil society. And what we do is that we bring them to a space where they all have to play together and people have to go on the floor and play with whatever we're telling them to do. And it's such an incredible experience. One of the best things that I have witnessed one year after I joined the foundation, I brought some people from the Mexican government and there is a center in Harvard that is called the Center on the Developing Child. And the professor who is head of the center, he's one of the most renowned person in the early childhood space. And he was on the floor playing with Mexican minister next to a practitioner or a woman who owned an early childhood center in one of the poorest areas of Mexico and some other people. And they were all playing together. And even there was like not so much, not everyone spoke English. So, but there was an understanding of the task and they were all doing it. And so there is no way there's hierarchy there because everyone is at floor level, everyone is building, being silly, and just having fun. And it triggers lots of different conversations that otherwise wouldn't happen. There's no way that someone from, especially like people in government in countries like Mexico, they're very formal and there's like lots of hierarchy and you have to address them a certain way. And when they're on the floor just playing with someone that is on their team that probably they have never spoken to, it changes completely the dynamic. And just for that, it's an incredible way to foster these connections and collaboration. And do they get a bit like, uh, at the beginning, or do they go willingly? Or does it <laughs> oh, just no. depend? Definitely. It takes some time, but I think it's also, it creates the effect because there are so many people that have been there before. So it's almost like if you are not into it, you are not cool. I, I have so to say- So there's peer I, pressure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. And I remember sometimes we wanted to convince some ministers from Mexico, we will bring them, but we know that other people that we have brought before, they're converted, let's call them that. And so the new minister comes who doesn't believe in play or like a more modern education, there is more child centered. But when they come to this space and they're seeing all of the experts, and then there are like some people that are already converted that are also from the same country and context, then they start thinking that, oh, I'm out of the inner circle, right? And they want to be it. And so it has been a brilliant way to get people to experience how incredible and transformational play can be. Oh, that sounds so cool. And I can't believe it because we are out of time. I could talk, well, I know I could talk to you forever anyway, Diego. <laughs> Even yeah, though we rarely speak, but it's <laughs> been just so brilliant catching up with you. And learning more about you as well I suppose it's funny even when we do work with people and get to know people we still don't really know them yeah and by you making yourself available and writing about your life it gives all, everybody an insight into triggering memories for themselves as well I think and doing their own reflections which is it's so cool so I'll put a link to your blog 
in the show notes. Yeah, please do. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, as you are saying, I mean, you're leading the way. I mean, I, I have so much respect for what you are doing. I, I knew that you started your podcast and I was very proud that you started your podcast two years ago, two, three years ago. I had no idea how many episodes there are until I started listening and I listened one and another one. And it's so brave when you are on your own being vulnerable and reflecting and sharing about your life. And as you say, I feel like I know you so much better just because I listened to a couple of episodes of you talking to yourself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which is kind of... Kind sure of you on the wall when I speak. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's a great year and a great moment to do that and to connect in different ways now that we can have other means than the face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah, it is. And also, it's very cathartic. I think that's the other thing that I've found. It's actually mostly when I've felt alone with going through stuff throughout my life, you do feel alone. And when you realize that actually you're never alone, because no matter what's going on for you, other people are going through similar things. It mm. might not be exactly the same, but we can relate to each other. And there's huge power in that, I think, just huge power. And yeah, sometimes I'm, I am talking to myself, but I'm also <laughs> hoping that it's helping somebody else who might not be in any way trying to do what I'm doing, but it just triggers something. And I think that's the power of reflection. Definitely. I mean, just listening to some of those episodes, it got me thinking so much and reflecting so much about life and myself. And yeah, keep doing it. Oh, don't worry. What was I going to say? I was going to ask you something else. Right. So 50 now is in the offing. <laughs> it's all downhill from here, Diego. I know. <laughs> all the way to 50. So have you thought about what you're going to do at 41? Is there a challenge ahead? Yes. <laughs> Do you want to keep it to yourself? No, I, I can tell you quickly for the next two years, 41 is an important year in gay rights in Mexico. There was a big thing in the early 1900s in Mexico where there was a secret club where gay men will go to get together and have like their safe space. And at some point the government went there and arrested all of them. And there were 41. So 41 became an important number for uh, the gay community or LGBTQ plus community in Mexico. So I'm going to do something around that. I still don't know exactly what, but 42 for sure will be a marathon. Oh, a marathon. Okay. <laughs> Have you done one already? No, I've always waited. I run a lot, but I yeah. always said that I, I will only do a marathon when I'm 42. Because it's 42 kilometers? Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay. I was thinking in miles, you see. So, uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now I get it. See, back to the numbers there. <laughs> oh, yeah. We end on numbers again, but that's that's really powerful, the 41. I mean, I felt that. So, mm. yeah, wow. That's great. But anyway, the 40s are a phenomenal decade, Diego. I can honestly yeah. say that. <laughs> For the three, four months that I've been in them, I love them. Yeah. <laughs> And I also just, what you said at the beginning about what was I doing with my time before, I think that's such a brilliant way of looking at things as well, because I have this thing where so quick to say, I don't have time. I won't have time for that. I have no time. When actually we have all the time we want. Mm -hmm. And it's really about what we want to do with that time and how we want to spend it that matters and it's so easy to dismiss, I have no time. But actually, I always think if you're out sick for a week, the world goes on without you. Yeah. And that's a really good point. Because this year, I wanted this to be my priority. And if you want to do something, you'll find the time for sure. You'll, exactly. You'll find the time for sure. I might call the episode that. You'll find the time. <laughs> Diego, thank you so much. It's been amazing talking to you. I appreciate yeah. it. And you, we are in Vietnam at the moment, by the way, aren't you? Yes, I'm in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City. I'm here for six months, halfway already. Wow, amazing. Well, have fun. I know you, you will. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for the conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the paths we traversed on today's episode. If something rang through for you, be sure to let me know. 
Or maybe you can share this with someone in your life who would benefit from listening too. And if you enjoy helping others, I'd be so grateful if you would leave a review so that people who might also be curious about their own life beyond the numbers can discover this podcast too.